Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Sorry about I am Bob, drug addict and alcoholic. I am um, you guys just have to forgive the delay, but your committee is of the old school. They sort of figured that when you finished eating, the banquet was over, and then the meeting began, and you can't keep anybody out of a meeting, right? Right. I support that entirely. I'm glad to be in Seattle and to squash all rumors. Now I'm not quitting talking forever, just for the rest of the year. It's been a short year for me. <laughs> I'm used to long days. It's about time I had a short year. I, um, it's for a lot of reasons. Maybe I'll get into them. Maybe I won't. We'll see what happens. Most of it is I'm just in a place of personal change in my life, and I'm too vulnerable to uh, have to lay it out on, on a continuing basis because it's uh, I have to get adjusted. And it's an easy temptation when you talk a lot to to not project the new person you are and drop back into the old one that everybody's familiar with. And unfortunately, the old one is trying to kill me, so I'd kind of like to lose his ass and move on. You know. <laughs> so we'll try. We're trying to leave him out of all this. As you as you as you sit here tonight, um, I want you to give a little thought to this, and it's very difficult, or at least it's always been extremely difficult for me that. Beyond any contest or beyond the shadow of any doubt, the single, absolute, unequivocally most important person in this room sits in your chair. Okay? Think about that. The most important person in this room sits in your chair. There is nobody more important. Nothing. I have tried all my life to be anything other than than me. Always I could find somebody that had a better deal. They either looked better, they had more money, they drove a better car, they had a flashier broad, thank you very much. They had a better house, they had a better sense of humor, they had more friends. They had better dope. (laughs) But I could always find a reason to be anybody but me. And you know, the funny thing is, we read all these metaphysical books we work this program, and everything in the program says, well, you got to learn to give, right? And if you're going to have a relationship, you got to be loving and intimate, and, and, and uh, you got to be caring, and you have to be considerate, and you have to be kind, and you have to be honest. And it's taken me, took me 17 years in this program to learn that I can't be caring with you, I can't be intimate with you, I can't be honest with you, I can't be considerate of you until I can be caring about me, until I can be intimate with me, until I can be considerate of myself, until I can give to me. It's easy for me to give to you. You know, I mean, I don't know about anybody else, I came from the streets, man. Giving and buying and maneuvering and moving is part of the game, it's control. I give to you, I own you. No big deal. Simple. See? So I gotta learn, I don't want to receive. Don't give me nothing. I don't deserve anything. I, I'm a little, uh, blessed man, you know? I mean, don't, don't be bugging me with this horse shit about being a good person. I know better. Ask my parents. <laughs> I love chit-chatting about my parents. Well, I discovered something in AA through a lot of pain, misery, and discomfort, and a lot of years of insane sobriety, which is I always thought that none of what transpired from birth to age 15 when I discovered the wonderful world of chemicals had any importance in my life. That was sort of a non-consequential period of my life. I just breezed through it. I couldn't remember any of it either, but I just breezed through it. And the fact that I never remembered it never bothered any of my sponsors, with which I took countless inventories, because they never remembered theirs either. 
So for them to be confronted with somebody who could not recall their childhood was perfectly normal. See, we judge everybody by ourselves. You know, I only judge you by me. I was really glad after sponsoring about 100 guys to find out everybody wasn't like me, you know. I said not to want to sponsor people. I think, oh, God, the son of a bitch is going to steal from me, man. He's going to take this. He's going to do this. He's going to lie or use on the side. And then I discovered, kind yeah, there's really people who weren't like that. You know, they really wanted to work, you know, get well. I thought, term I don't understand, but we'll move on. <laughs> Somebody left me a watch. Gave it back. <clears throat> that time after 19 and a half years, goddamn. <laughs> there was a moment there that'd make a nice gift. <laughs> the thinking hasn't changed. It's that I no longer listen. I live a life that my head doesn't understand because it's not the one being dictated to me. The one being dictated to me is stay home, hide out, ignore, don't get involved, and for God's sakes avoid change. Yeah. And new circumstances and new situations. It's critical you avoid those. Always go to the same meetings. <laughs> when someone suggests going somewhere you've never been before for a new experience, don't go. <laughs> Be cool. Oh, no, you know, man, I don't think, uh, I got some other things going on. It's all right, you know. I'll, I'll catch you next time. You wonder why you don't like new experiences. For me, it's come out to be very simple. My mind can't control me when I'm in a new situation because I have to pay attention to where the hell I'm at or I'm really going to look like an asshole, right? <laughs> So to avoid looking really bad, I will pay attention to where I'm at. And now my mind is no longer, well, I think we should go here, we should do this. Screw the mind. Let's talk about the heart. I get so sick of talking about the mind. My mind gets sick of hearing me talk about it, too. <laughs> I broke its hold, you know. It doesn't have a lot of use for me anymore. It's a... <laughs> You think God ignores me a lot now, you know. It doesn't rule my life. I have, um, I have come to understand that I am the most important person in the room through an awesome amount of pain and sobriety. Uh, if somebody said to me, what do you think is the single biggest problem of the recovering alcoholic? I would have to say self-esteem. That we have probably, I have, and the few people that I'm close to, that we talk about these things with no holes barred, probably the lowest self-esteem in the world. Uh, mine was given to me as a gift with great love by my parents. I don't know where you got yours. <laughs> my parents understood their limitations. They were smart enough never to get a dog. <laughs> Cold shot, right? Well, let's talk about that for a while. There's a lot of myths that float around, you know. And one of the ones that almost killed me in AA is when I finally began to remember a little of my childhood. Is like, well, your mom and your dad did the best they could. My father was a practicing alcoholic. I don't know if you have it up here, but but in L.A. and in New York, Al-Anon has a, a program that's for the children of alcoholic parents. And it's awesome. And it's, as a child of an alcoholic parent, you can be 50. I mean, right? It's not for kids, babe. It's for, and most alcoholics I know who go to these meetings can't stay through the first part of it. That the preamble that they read is so devastating to those of us who are alcoholics, who grew up with alcoholic parents that were almost forced to run because they read your personality for you, right? While you sit there and listen. And it's a result of what happened to you. Well, we've all, I've been conditioned to not believe that. I've been conditioned to say, well, accept the responsibilities for the asshole you are and go on about, you know, being that and forget it. And your parents did the best job they could with the information they had. God bless them. <laughs> That's true. 
absolutely true. There's nothing incorrect or wrong with that statement. My mother did to me what was done to her by her parents, and my father did to me what was done to him by his parents. They gave me all the information that they had gathered from their own parents. They did the very best possible job they could do. They couldn't have done it any better under the circumstances with the information that they had. Here's where the big problem came in with me and a lot of other people I know. Somehow everybody says that and then they close the door on the past. Well, they did the best job they could. Now I'll go on with life. Right? My parents did the best job they could. The reality is it was a rotten fucking job. <laughs> And the pain I had to go through to make that discovery is astounding, absolutely astounding. You know, I have been four deep breaths away from nervous breakdowns and sobriety on about seven occasions. You know, I have locked my way in, uh, myself away in my apartment and cried for four days at a time. Thank God I was around a lot of lunatics. Nobody had enough sense to realize what was going on. Or somebody would have taken me for help. You know, they just thought I was having a couple of bad days. Leave him alone. He'll be all right. <laughs> just cries a lot. He gets emotional when he gets upset. <laughs> Take him some food. Drop off a little coffee. Leave him be, you know. So now that I have to look back and say, God, no, you know, it, it's, this, it's, I have had... One of the things I do more than anything else in the world in my life is I diminish the importance of anything important. I will do it with words. I will hang labels on things, you know. Somebody will, I will say to somebody, well, I, you know, somebody gave me uh, a, a book and, uh, you know, some shit. Cast it aside. It will have no, that way it's got no importance. So if I lose the book or if it's taken away from me, I won't feel any pain. I mean, I live under this lie that if I make my job, if I really enjoy what I do for a living, if I really get attached to my job, if I really love the situation in my life, it's going to be taken away from me. You know, if I really love you, if I really love a person in my life, whether it be a friend or whether it be a woman in my life, that will be ripped away from me. I mean, these beliefs are buried in me, see, because every time I got attached to anything as a kid, it was removed. For one reason or another, it was gone. So I believe that, you know, I'm like, I'm entrenched in that. And the first time I ever began to discover that was one day, I worked in the motion picture industry, and I was at the studio. One day, a friend of mine came to visit me for lunch, and he'd been sober about the same amount of time as I had, a couple years less. And he had never been on a motion picture studio a lot in his life, right? Never. Right. So, this guy has no cool at all, none, right? He's like a little kid. He doesn't understand how important it is to hold it back. <clears throat> <laughs> He's walking around that studio, and like, I don't want to know him, right? He's going, wow, look at that. Jesus, that's, what's his name? Uh, uh, what the hell is he? That's the guy from Ash. Oh, God, look, isn't that? I mean, like, right, you know, all through lunch in the accommodation. He's like, wow, oh, Jesus, that's, oh, great. God, I think you're terrific, right? He'd walk over and go, fucking God, you know. <laughs> Oh, I don't come back to my table, go to the kitchen. <laughs> well, we walked back and I showed him some stages and he got crazy and I took him down there doing some special effects stuff and they pulled off this great gig and he had the balls to walk up to the guy and ask him how he did it. <laughs> you know. <laughs> I've been in the industry 11 years, I didn't know how he did it because I never asked, man. <laughs> I was cool, you know. I just stood on the sidelines and watched. <laughs> Got back to my office. We said a few words. He left and went home. I sat in my office and I started getting mad. Uh -huh. I thought, <clears throat> I've been working here for 11 years, man, in this business. And this son of a bitch has had more fun in one day. <laughs> with what I do that I've had in 12 years, you know. 
and something's got me wrong with my philosophy because he, he had a genuine great time, you know. He left saying, God, we're going to do this again, man. This is wild, you know. <laughs> And I'm thinking, if you come to the gate, man, all the guards remove you, you know, I don't even want to know. So I tell you, I'll go walk around this joint, see what's going on. <laughs> so I left, and I got out, and I went around, and I started looking at all this stuff. I said, this is a trip here, man. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Jesus Christ, nothing is as it's supposed to be, and this is false, and we can make, you know, horrendous windstorms, and we can make Africa and sawdust, and, you know, Jesus, it's like... I just suddenly got really turned on to the business I've been in for 11 years. And I'm like walking around like a kid, you know. Now I enjoy the hell out of it. It's two years later. I love every minute of it. You know, I go in now in the morning. I'm thrilled goddamn to death. And my problems don't stop from the minute I hit the door, you know. And it's like, it's wonderful. I'm filled with wonder over. It's like, wow, we send out things. We entertain people. You know, it's, it's a trip. It's really great. And I said, God, the only person for 11 years who has been keeping you from enjoying this is you. <laughs> Nobody else. Nobody else. And I started to look at other things in my life. And I said, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't been having a lot of fun lately. <laughs> I've been collected. Cool. Easy. I had a gong show last night. Blew me away. Absolutely blew me away. I mean, to the audience and the participants, you have my love, and I just knocked me out. Greatest thing in the world. Greatest thing in the world. Let go, you know. Let go. I mean, Alan and I seem to have this sense that control belongs to them. <laughs> Man, I'm as much in control, passed out, nose down on the floor as you are standing over me. Because <laughs> I got you standing over me, you know what I mean? And I didn't... Oh, that's why I was taking my glass. Good. <laughs> Immediate negative reattitude. I don't think she's going to refill it. Somebody got my glass. <laughs> <laughs> I, will, I will jump to the negative of everything. My mind loves the negative. It doesn't understand the positive. You know? And people have said to me for years, go ahead, hold that thought. <laughs> you know, think life is shit. Hang on to that thought. Go ahead, it's tough out there. Hold that one. And it will be. And I used to I used to laugh at this stuff, and I used to ignore this stuff. I used to think it was a joke, and it's true. I mean, you don't have to believe me. Please hang on to whatever solid ideas you have. <laughs> <clears throat> but it is as you believe it is. It is as you believe it is. You believe it's tough out there? It's tough out there. You believe that you're never going to succeed? You ain't never going to succeed. You believe that, you know, you're a failure in this department or that department or in life itself, and you will continue to be just that. And no one can change that for you. No one. It must be done by you. And that's where the problem of self-esteem came in for me. I was unwilling to do it for me. See, I would do it for you. Um, a prime example came to me a while back. <clears throat> I was injured. Well... I was I was doing a lot of running, and I was having a lot of fun with it, but the only problem was I had a number of different pairs of shoes with different soles for different services. <sighs> Typical neurotic. <laughs> so every time I would change shoes for a different surface, they fit me different, and I'd get a blister in a different place on my foot if I forgot to Vaseline shoe, right? So I was running one day, mumbling to a marathoning friend of mine about this, and he says, ah, Jesus, go to a podiatrist, get some orthotics, put in your shoes, and that way each pair of shoes will stay the same. You know, you just move them from one pair to the other, and your shoes are always the same. And go see this guy in Long Beach. He's terrific. I lived in Santa Monica at the time. Long Beach is a long way from Santa Monica. <clears throat> at least 30 minutes. <laughs> so... 
I thought, no, I'll go see this guy in Century City, closer. So I go to Century City, I go to see the guy. He says, well, I don't do those things, but I got a gal who's coming into practice with me in a month. She doesn't. Now, normally, under usual circumstances, I would understand that God had just closed the door, right? I don't do it. Somebody's coming in a month. And I would have gone to Long Beach like I'd been told to go in the first place. But I said, I'll wait. It's cool. I did, and she came on, and she made me some orthotics, and I went out for an easy three-mile run, went home, sat down for an hour, and couldn't walk. She made him wrong. I'd throw my back out. <clears throat> so I am trying to run and limp along, you know, and mumbling to my friends, and they said, listen, what you got to do is you got to go see these guys in Pasadena. <laughs> They're heavy into sports medicine. The one guy's for the U.S. Olympics team. They're runners themselves. They're the best in the world, man, and they will fix it up for you and get you on a, on a road of, of, of a, a program of recovery that will get you back, you know, on the trails. <clears throat> well, I thought about it, you know, and Pasadena is further than Long Beach, for Christ's sake. <clears throat> <laughs> Tragedy here is I would drive you to Pasadena. If you came to me and said, my back is out and the doctors that have been recommended to me are in Pasadena, I'd say, Jesus, get in the car. I'll take you. But I'm not taking me. <clears throat> I'm going to the marina, which is closer. This chiropractor comes out. He's 40 pounds overweight. I mentioned the word running, and his guys glaze over. He pop my back back in shape. I go out and run three miles, six miles, eight miles. He'd go back out again. I go back. He put it in. I go run. It go out. And we went through this for about a month. I got in the fucking car and drove to Pasadena. <laughs> <clears throat> and all the way I'm driving to Pasadena, I thought, why didn't you drive yourself to Pasadena in the first place? You have friends that would have driven you to Pasadena if you'd asked them. I thought, I guess I didn't drive myself to Pasadena in the first place because the basic conception I have of myself is a turd. <laughs> I'm not of value to take care of. All right? I lean towards self-destruction. <laughs> like, <laughs> a lot towards self-destruction. <laughs> And you can do it thinking. You don't have to do anything. You just sit home and think your way right into it, you know. <clears throat> and I used to talk about this stuff, but I never really fully understood what I was saying. I mean, the impact of it never really hit me. I used to say, you know, that I, I am my worst enemy. I used to say that no living human being, if any person on this earth did to me what I have done to myself, I would have to kill them. I mean, it wouldn't even be a choice. I would, I mean, I would be, I mean, you know, I'd have to kill. Nobody would think of doing to me what I've done to myself. I've said that for years. I talked about that for years, but I never made that goddamn connection. You know, it's like it kept escaping me because I kept thinking that was okay. I'm wrong. You know, I'll do this to me. It's okay. What the hell? I'm, I can handle it. I'm tough. You know, fuck it. One more time, you know. <laughs> God damn it. Don't be gentle. <laughs> Get gentle and they'll get you, just sure as hell. I don't know who, you know, but somebody will, you know. You can count on it. And I started to reflect over other things that happened to me, and I began to realize that nothing was important to me. Nothing mattered to me. I didn't care about anything, you know, because I wouldn't let myself care about anything. Because I, I am not of enough value to have anything of value in my life, so I must diminish the importance. And one of the stories I love to tell, because it's critical to what I do, is <clears throat> I was put in a position... Well, I had to write a script for a show in a big hurry. I had four days to do the script, and I did it. I got an airplane, and I left, and I went to Hawaii. Just turned it in and left town, right? And I was over there about three days. A letter shows up in the mailbox where I was staying from the producers on this show. I took the letter out of the mailbox, and I stood there reading through the envelope like all good alcoholics can do. <laughs> And I knew what it said. It said, not only will you never work for this show again, 
You'll probably never work for the studio again, and we have our way. You'll never work in the goddamn industry again. This is the worst piece of shit we ever read in our lives, right? <clears throat> Finally, the gal standing there in the driveway with me, watching me stare at this envelope for about five minutes, you know, <laughs> figuring out, why don't you open it up? <clears throat> <laughs> <clears throat> Ridiculous idea. <clears throat> when you have the powers of perception that I have, why the hell are you going to go So I opened the envelope and the letter said, Well, we want to thank you very much for the care and the time and the love that you put into the script. It's one of the finest scripts ever written for this show. We are so moved by it, we refuse to rush it to production. We will wait till you come home to make the changes so we can give it the time and the money that it deserves. Lots of love to produce. You know what my next remark was? Well, at least they aren't pissed off. <laughs> I should have been able to jump up in the middle of the driveway and scream and shout and say, Yeah, all right, man, I'm a good goddamn writer. And they love me. And it's okay. I fucking did the work and I deserve it! Eh, at least they ain't mad. Let's go to the beach. <sighs> well, you say, God, uh, how does that happen to you? You know, I mean, how do you get like that? What the hell I do that I think so poorly of myself? Where did I get this value system that I use, you know? I remember a story I haven't told it a long time. It's funny this came to me. I, I went to t I went to hear a guy talk one time who wasn't in A. He was talking to a bunch of realtors, but somebody said, You gotta hear this guy, right? And I and I went against my better judgment. It was one of those things I said yes to because I wanted to impress somebody and I spent a week regretting, you know. I tried to talk myself out of going and I had to go, so I went. This guy talked about levels of spirituality, but there's never a message in here because it's a heavy message about value. And you're saying there are different levels of spiritual awareness or life. <clears throat> and that the lowest level of spiritual reality is where things are more important than people. Where an object has more value than people have. And he said an example of this, it just tra he had like four kids. And an example of this, it just transpired in his own home. Their sister, his sister-in-law had given him a very, very expensive, expensive uh, porcelain pitcher from Europe. An, an antique one. And his eight-year-old daughter was carrying this pitcher filled with milk from the refrigerator in the kitchen. I already liked the guy, right, because it was in use, not in a glass case. <laughs> was carrying his pitcher from the kitchen to the living room and his stocking feet, and she slipped on the kitchen floor, fell, dropped it, and the pitcher shattered into hundreds of pieces all over the kitchen floor. And he said, at this exact instant in this child's life is a critical, critical moment. Because how we respond to what has just happened is going to be how she views herself in all the rest of her life in relation to objects. He said, now we could have jumped up and said, you goddamn dummy, look what you've done. You broke this valuable picture. And he said, but instead we rushed to her and we said, are you okay? Are you hurt? Are you fine? Huh? Did you ever drop anything in your house? I dropped a couple of things around my house. Nobody ever asked how I was. He's waiting for me to get up so they could knock me down again. Yeah, you know. <laughs> he said, after we got all the, all the glass cleaned up, all the milk cleaned up and everything, we sat down and we discussed the impracticability of carrying heavy objects on newly waxed floors and stocking feet. And he said, the next low level of spirituality is where animals are more important than people. He said, if you don't think that's true, he said, imagine, if he said, if you don't think you have a low opinion of yourself for a moment, <clears throat> imagine that your best friends stop by your house and they have this wonder show dog. Okay? Wins the blue ribbon in every show he's ever in. No matter where it is or world class, it doesn't matter. It's an incredible animal. They say, we want you to take care of this dog for us for a week. Here's his special menu. Here's his vitamins. And he's got to be in bed at nine every night. He said, he said would, would you take this dog out to McDonald's for a hamburger, give him a cigarette and a cup of coffee? <laughs> Hell no, man. You see, he gets his diet and he goes to bed. You know, it's you that you take out to McDonald's and you give the cigarette and a cup of coffee to. Yeah.
He said another example of, of when animals are more important than people is he said him and a friend of his, a third friend of theirs had claimed a racing horse at Santa Anita. So these, so Grant, the guy's name was Grant. Grant and his friend went out to pick this racing horse up at Santa Anita, and they like a guy paid like you know fifty grand for it, whatever the hell it was. It was an expensive horse. He got them all loaded in the horse trailer in the back of the car, and they're coming back in on the San Bernardino freeway. And Grant said he looked over at his friend who was driving the car, and he was doing about forty miles an hour on the freeway, right? And he's clutching the steering wheel so so hard his knuckles are white, and every time there'd be a kerthunk in the horse trailer hitch, the guy would almost have a heart attack. And Grant said to him, "What the hell is the matter with you, man? You know." And the guy said, Jesus, I have never had anything this valuable in my car before. <laughs> and he said, I looked over and said, you son of a bitch, I'm sitting next to you. I'm a human being. <laughs> he said, you mean if there wasn't a goddamn horse on the back of the car, you'd be doing 90 miles an hour, weaving in and out of traffic? You know, what the hell is this? And I, boy, I'll tell you, man, after I heard that one, did it ever put me in touch with my own speedometer? <laughs> when I'm in the car, one of the best yardsticks I have today are where I'm at. You know, if I'm out there willing to die for 10 feet of concrete, <sighs> something's wrong inside of me. It's got nothing to do with nobody else. If I'm doing 90, man, boiling in the freeway, you know. I gotta look at these, something's wrong with me, cause I'm, I'm in the goddamn car. And I'm driving like nobody's home, you know. <laughs> uh, no one of any consequences in this vehicle, floor it. <laughs> he said the next level of spirituality is false humanitarianism. He said, it's why you do something for someone and make sure a large number of people know what you have done. <clears throat> there was another level. I don't remember what the hell it was. <clears throat> and then he said, and this is very ap appropriate to us, and I think it should be very important to us. He said, then the last and the, and the top level of spirituality is where we finally come to the realization that we are it. That we are definitely, truly, in fact, God's finest creation. That we are the most single, most important thing on this planet. And the only thing we have of any value is ourselves and each other. And any time we put anything in between those relationships, me with me or me with you, something's wrong. Something's wrong spiritually if I put anything between you and me. Or if I put anything between me and me, it's, it's easier. It's as easy for me to do it to me as it is to do it to you. And if you think about us, and hey, my God, how important are we to each other? I mean, that's what this program is all about. My, you know, you're putting your hand out to me and saying, hey, I love you, I care about you, sit down, let me help you out. And then I never knew why. I mean, I don't know how many alcoholics do. Most of us who come in here can't figure these people out. Wonder what the hell they want. What do they want? You know, they want, what do they want? They gotta want something. Nobody does this for nothing. You know, I certainly don't. <laughs> when I was going through this foot crisis with my orthotics and my feet doctors and my sports medicine doctors and all this crap, God in his infinite wisdom, <clears throat> he likes to make sure I stay on the path of recovery. I'm sitting home. <clears throat> I, I finally went to the, the right podiatrist, the one in Long Beach. <clears throat> and he looked at my right foot. He said, Jesus, you've got what amounts to almost a club foot. I said, what? He said, yes. See? And I said, well, you know, right? You're dopey, man. you got so many goddamn bullet holes and scars and bent bones and shit that you never pay any attention to the foot that's a little crooked. It's nothing. You know, it's... Oh, shit, it's been that way ever since I can remember. No big deal, you know. <clears throat> so I said, well, when did I get it? What happened? You know, I mean, what caused it? He said, I don't know. It's when you were a kid. So I went home that night. I'm uncomfortable. I'm really uncomfortable. Something inside me is wrong, man. There's anger inside of me and funny feelings. And I'm like, I'm sick at my stomach. I don't understand it. The phone rings. It's my mother. I love God's sense of humor. <laughs> I 
And she opens the conversation complaining to me about her foot doctor that she had been to that day. <laughs> you want to talk about timing? <clears throat> so when she got done with her usual routine, I said, as long as we're on the subject of feet, <laughs> did I ever have any problem with my feet when I was a child? Because I don't remember. She said, oh yeah, you had weak arches. High arches and they were weak. I said, and? And she said, well, we had to get special shoes for you, <clears throat> for these arches, and they were really expensive. They were very, very expensive shoes. They cost a lot of money. <laughs> oh, fuck. You know, that stuff is... <laughs> uh, and yeah, yeah, you want to know why I walk around feeling like a turd? <laughs> About five times she told me how expensive these goddamn shoes were while I'm having this phone conversation, right? I thought, oh, well, screw it. You know, I hang up the phone. I didn't sleep that night, man. I was really uncomfortable and miserable. Thank God I was going to see my therapist the next day, right? And I get there, man. I hit the couch. And I said, I don't know. Something's wrong. But I'm like, you know, on my feet. And, I don't know. and she quieted me down, you know, after a while. And she said, let's just take it back, you know, let's just quietly walk back and find this little boy and see where he's at and see what's going on. And I found him, you know, and he was about two and a half years old, and he was standing there in a little pair of short pants, and he was in a hallway in a building in Colorado, and he was crying, see, and he was crying because his shoes were too goddamn tight, and they were too small, and they hurt. And he was relating to his mother that his feet hurt. His mother was telling him not to mention it because his father would get pissed off because his shoes cost him. And you wonder why I feel like a turner. We walk around thinking all those things have no consequences. They have staggering consequences. Staggering. I'm not worth buying shoes for that fit. <whistles> Took me ten years in this program to quit dressing like a bum. You know, it's been, it's taken me forever to get where I would buy good clothes for me. You know, I had a meeting last week, two weeks ago. I was at a network and it was like, all the way to the top, the big kids, right? So I looked in the closet, and the only blazer I had had gold buttons on it, but one of them was different than the others, you know? Because <laughs> the cleaners had lost three of them and found two, and I didn't have enough goddamn self-worth to make them buy me ten new ones. I looked at them, I, I'm not going to do this to myself, right? I really felt great. I looked at the closet, and I said, no, man, screw it. Out I went. Bought about $500 worth of stuff. A couple of jacket slacks, went home. Saturday night, Sunday night, I figured out what I was going to wear on Monday morning, so I didn't have to get crazy with that one. You know, I've, I've gone under trying to figure that one out. <laughs> Ever dress for an important occasion? A good neurotic can just absolutely collapse in front of the mirror. So I figured out what I was going to wear, and I went to the meeting, and I felt terrific because I had goddamn dressed myself. You know, I mean, I think that's one of the reasons banquets are so important for us in Alcoholics Anonymous. We let the child dress up, you know, in mommy's clothes, daddy's clothes, whoever's clothes. You know, it's like we allow ourselves to dress up. It's like we're almost forced to do it a little bit. It's like, oh, God, this is really okay, but I'm very uncomfortable. I don't have I'd rather have on something good, you know, funky, man, some shirt here. All the jeans and good shirt. Why am I uncomfortable in good clothes? No one should be uncomfortable in good clothes. They even fit better than the funky clothes. They're made of better fabric than the funky clothes. They're basically more comfortable. Huh? Guess you don't deserve them. So why I'm uncomfortable in them? I don't have enough baggage that I can wear them, you know. That's changing. All right, goes my glass. <laughs> <laughs> well, the mind doesn't quit. We were down to the market today, right? <clears throat> and there's a place down there they make a little pin with a name on it, right? It's made out of wire, all right? Now, my mind it looks at this and says, oh, it'd be nice to buy one of these for a friend of yours, but it says, I knew they didn't have this one specific name because it's a highly unusual name. And I said, but, you know, they'll make them special orders on request. And then my mind says, it'll take two days. And I said, to the girl, how long will it take? She said, three, four minutes. <clears throat> I said, oh, okay, great. I said, you know, I, <clears throat> I gave her the name, and I expect her to pull this machine out from underneath the table, hidden, right? That you put the wire in and punch buttons, and it goes, <laughs> and makes the thing. Instead, she takes a little pair of needlepoint pliers and just 
starts making the name. And I stood there and I thought, one more fucking time. You know, <clears throat> my mind's out there ripping along ahead of me, dead wrong on every point, you know. <clears throat> You're better off following a lunatic than you are your own mind. <laughs> Probably because it's conditioned by uh, all the wonderful childhood experiences that you have had. I, uh, <clears throat> somebody said to me the other day, I was, I, uh, the gal I go to the latest is there, she said, you know, what you understand, one of these days, you're going to have to find it in your heart to forgive your mother. My old man's dead. I can't get to him. <laughs> and I said, yeah, I realize that. And I, I'm fully aware of that. I said, but unfortunately, right now, I can't do that. And the reason I can't do that is that I'm still convinced that the minute I forgive her, that suddenly invalidates me and makes me wrong. That everything I'm trying to do is wrong if I say she's okay. And I can't let that go yet. And I'll give you an example of why. My father was a chronic alcoholic. Alcoholic from the day Went through 14 years of alcoholism with him. Threw him out. By then it was too late because I was off and running. Man, I was loose in the streets, using drugs, sticking people up, generally having a good time. <laughs> she went through 12 years of, of prisons, hospitals, institutions, shootouts with police, all the bullshit with me, right? Never went to an Al on me. Not 14 years with my father, not the 12 years I'm out ripping and running the streets. Came to the program of Alcoholics Anonymous and bounced along the program of Alcoholics Anonymous for 18 years, man. And for the last year and a half, I've been in therapy and I've been learning a few things, and so I don't go when I'm called anymore, and I don't always return her calls anymore, and I'm not there with the big Christmas presents anymore, and I'm like, you know... I send fruit from Harry and David's or something now, you know, right? <clears throat> like I send to other friends of mine. And I don't respond and I don't play the game anymore. So now here it is. Well, let's see. What? 16 and 18. 34 years later, my mother went to an Allen on me. But she didn't go to an Allen on me because I was sick. She didn't go to an Allen on me because I was a drug addict and an alcoholic being drugged through all the institutions in the state of California. She didn't go to Al and I because my poor goddamn father was a chronic alcoholic, never drew a sober breath in his life. She went to Al Anon because she lost control. Lost control. I listened to her talk to me about it. And I could hear the game. Oh, thank God, Jesus. Otherwise, I might have gone for it. And I hope one day it works. But unfortunately, they're starting to talk to her about her. <laughs> <laughs> Not her favorite subject. <laughs> I am her favorite subject. <clears throat> I'm into a place now in my own personal life where I'm starting to get into a very gentle person who lives inside of me. Uh, he's also a very fragile person. And um, I don't like to expose him a lot because he's, you know, he's still, he like peeks out from around the corner. And, um, uh, the child in me is very frightened because I've never taken good care of the child in me. You know, I've always put him in bad situations and terrible people and all the rest of that crap <clears throat> throughout my whole life. But I'm getting very fond of this person now. I have more use for me than I have ever had in my life. And what's coming at this, which is really fascinating, is I'm beginning to have a relationship with me. And it's staggering. Uh, I found out that I was born okay. I was really okay. Nothing needed to be done. You know, certainly nothing of what was done needed to be done. The other thing I'm learning, which is critical for me, is everything that happened to me as a small child I didn't deserve. I did nothing to deserve what happened to me. And as I, <clears throat> as I find this sensitive person, I'm starting to like him. But I'm very afraid, see. Because all my life I have hid behind the safety of anger and the safety of ferociousness or coolness, you know. Everything's all right. Don't worry about it, you know. And walk away feeling nothing. And the thing I begin to realize is it's like a pattern in sobriety. 
Only my own opinion. For those of you who knew everything I'm saying, if you haven't figured it out already, is my own opinion. <clears throat> but I'm like, I believe there's a pattern to recovery like there's a pattern to the disease. The disease has a certain pattern it follows right into oblivion, and I think recovery has a certain pattern that it follows. And, it, <clears throat> and unless something's done to alter it, it seems that between three and five years, well, you come into AA in the beginning, in the first year, if you're lucky, if you're really fucking sick, it's kind of numb, you know, it's just sort of, uh, you know. <clears throat> you're just not, you know, you know you're not going to make the first year anyway, so it's not terribly important. <laughs> so you just wander around. <clears throat> and the second year comes, and if you have insane sponsors, you're like so goddamn active, you can't see straight, right? Going to 40 meetings a week, speaking in institutions, going to hospitals, call, you know, hauling newcomers there, throwing up on you and your car and your palace. It's like it's busy, busy, you know, active, active, busy, busy, you know. Next thing you know, another year has gone by. Not much has happened, but you're two years clean and sober, right? For the first time. And, no <clears throat> and nothing happens. You know. It's like, God, that was great. I think next time I'll take a girl. <laughs> <You know. clears throat> probably get in trouble, but I'll do it anyway. You know. <laughs> and you get into the third year, and you're still a little busy, but you slow down a little bit, but you start to get a little uncomfortable. Ah, you don't worry about what the hell. You know, you figure, that's all right. Sobriety's got to be uncomfortable at some point. And then you start rolling into four and five. And if you pay any attention around AA, you'll notice that there's a very noticeable absence of people with six, seven, and eight years of sobriety. And the reason I believe there's a noticeable absence of people with six, seven, and eight years of sobriety is that five years your feelings come back. <laughs> right? We have spent, if you're like me, you have spent your entire life doing anything you can do to avoid feeling what you are really feeling at the moment. Now that, if you're interested, is the original way to miss all of life. <laughs> Just let life go right on by it. It's like <clears throat> after the initial pain of some of those wonderful... See, I was raised in a quiet house. I was raised in a house where silence was golden. You neither cried nor shouted with joy. Either extreme was unforgivable. Silence. Control. Two-year-old cool. <laughs> you know, only to stay alive, man. You know, you learn to be cool, to be contained, to be controlled. I forgot where I was going. It was very interesting, but I lost it. <laughs> oh, five years of sobriety, yes. <clears throat> I have heard, as I listen to thousands of stories in AA, and I hear people talk, if they particularly start with their story before they drink, even though sometimes they don't know what they're talking about, they use the word escape instead of stuffed feelings. I escaped into dolls. I escaped into sports. I escaped into books. I escaped into this. I escaped into that. Well, what you really did is you got lost and obsessed in whatever you were doing, so that you didn't have to deal with the goddamn feeling. Well, here you are five years clean and sober, and suddenly these suckers are coming back. Watch people at meetings as they roll into that period of their sobriety. You'll just see a look on their faces. How are you? Everything's all right. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Things are cool. Just went bankrupt through the courts, lost my goddamn job. I'm working in a car wash. My hemorrhoids are back. But other than that, it's all right. <laughs> And that was my story, man, at four years, right? Broke, bankrupt, car repoed, working at a car wash for a buck and a quarter. Now I'd start at $1.35. <laughs> Just generally roaring through successful sobriety. <laughs> Friend said, take a cake. I said, nah, man, there's nothing to say to the newcomer. You know, what the hell I say to a newcomer? Come in here, bust your ass for four years, you can be broke, no car, sleeping on a guy's couch, working a fucking car wash, right? <laughs> I was borrowing money from my babies. I had to make sure that the guys at the central office were trying to give me were sober and had a car so they could pick me up so I could take them to the meeting. <laughs> And on top of all that, the feelings are coming back. 
And I don't want to deal with the feelings. So I got angry. I went through about five years of anger. And, you know, it's like energy. I went for the energy. You know, anything but... Anyhow, I surrendered to God. That's one thing I did. I went from year four to year five just crazy. At year five, I said, God, if you're not there, I'm fucked. <laughs> it's over. I'm finished. I've done everything AA's asked me to do. I've written 15 goddamn inventories. I've been to 3 million institutions. I've driven 40,000 AA miles a year. I've done it all, and I'm just about to sit here and die. And I don't mean take my life. Suicide would have been a step up, you know, the, <clears throat> the willingness to make an action to take my life would have been a positive move at that point. <clears throat> I wanted to just sit in one spot and die, you know, just tomorrow not come. I went to work the next day, and I broke my back after I surrendered. <laughs> and they hauled me to the hospital with my broken back, and I'm laying in the emergency room, and my mind is screaming at me, See you, dumb son of a bitch, I told you the minute you got next to God, he'd get you. And another part of me is saying, shut up, quit thinking. And for the first time in my life, I decided not to let appearances, appearances, and this is so important, man, have an impact on your belief system. I decided to hell with it. I was going to do what was put in front of me to do, to do, and I was going to believe that my life was in perfect order no matter what? Okay? Broken back, lost job, disability, screw it. My life is okay. God's here. I'm in order. Because I had worked it out for five years, and there I was. You know, I mean, that was the best I could do was the car wash, and that's it, you know. So I did what I was supposed to do. Filed for vocational rehabilitation, filed for disability, went every month to, to the disability people. It was a tragedy and a joke, right? I mean, you know how that shit goes. I mean, I'm a fruitcake. They gave me five after two tests. I came out five different things. <laughs> and it's like, you know, we just couldn't communicate. And we went through six months of this, and I just kept holding to the idea that I'm all right. I don't understand it, but my life's okay. And one night I'm sitting there in my little apartment reading TV Guide, and there was a thing in there that said, Do you want to be a writer? Would you like to be a writer? Right? Very funny. I said, geez, I think I'll try this. Tore it out, went in the next day to my vocational rehabilitation counselor, gave it to her. I said, I think I'd like to be a writer. <sighs> she laughed so hard, she almost, literally, I swear to God, fell out of her wheelchair. She almost just went out, you know. <clears throat> because she had in front of her my whole history. She had it all. She had my jacket. She had the medical record. She had mental history. She had educational history. She had it all. She had the applications I had filled out there for them, and she knew the following facts. A, I'm a phonetic speller. I can't spell. Okay? I'm one of these. It says D-E-D -E is dead. D-E-D -E spells dead. The A is unnecessary. <laughs> she knew I had failed English ever since the fourth grade. She knew I had never written anything. She knew I had never read anything. She knew I didn't know anybody that wrote anything. She knew I had never done anything that had anything to do with writing. And I had a tough time communicating on the goddamn, you know, applications, right? <clears throat> God, however, in his infinite wisdom, can knock out anybody, including bureaucracy. Listen to this. Pay attention. Because your mind will sell you short out there all the time. Well, I'm finished. You know, this is the state. You can't deal with the state. You know. It's just, if God ain't bigger than the state, uh, we're all in trouble. Well, she took the ad into her boss and said, here's what, you know, the kid wants to do. <clears throat> Well, I had been on their books for six months. I was the oldest case they had. I mean, everybody else had been that had came in the same month I came in had been placed a long time ago. See, I was the black mark. This guy would have signed for basket weaving for me, you know, anything to get rid of me. So he signed. Been writing ever since. No, I'll take a minute. I should. It's critical. I, at that time, I, I sent away for my books, and they sent me my books, and I first tried to write an article for a, a magazine, and it was really bad, and then I tried to write a short story, and it was worse, 
and I'm reading my books, and I said you should, it's critical that when you begin to write, write for a medium you're familiar with. And I thought, well, Jesus, I never read anything, you know. But I've logged a lot of hours in front of the tube, both sober and stone, so I'll try and write a television story. So I tried to write a story for Bonanza. Now, I never lived in the Old West, so it was as bad as a short story. <clears throat> it was worse, really, because I... Never mind, but it was really horrible. And I made it a point at that time in my sobriety not to know what the people I hung out with did for a living, because I was easily swayed. If I knew that John was a bank president and Fred was a plumber... And Fred came up and said, let's go to coffee after the meeting. And two minutes later, John came up and said, let's go to coffee. Fred was in trouble, right? Because I knew I could handle my own plumbing, but the banker I might need someday, so I'd go to coffee with a banker. So I just never asked people. One night, my buddy drops me off after a meeting because I still didn't have a car. And he says, what are you doing nowadays? I said, well, I'm trying to write a story for television. He said, no kidding, that's what I do. I want you to listen to God's handiwork here, okay? In my life, all right? God's hand, he must have felt I was very valuable, because I want to give you some of the moves that took place. So I said, I, he said, listen, if I can ever do anything for you, help you out, let me know, right? And I said, oh, God, great, right? So <clears throat> after I looked at this lousy Western, I kept reading my books, and it said, no, no, write, not only should you write for a medium you're familiar with, but write about something you know well. I thought, well, shit, crime, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> So I started watching all the crime shows, and I picked out Ironsides. I said, that's a neat show. I like the way he thinks. You know, his mind is fast. And I figured, well, I'll try and think of a story that I never saw on television. And I did, and I worked it all up, and I gave it to my friend, and he gave me about a dozen suggestions. And I, half of them I liked and half of them I didn't, so I ignored the half I didn't, and I did the other half. I got it all done. It was typed by me, a phonetic speller, right? <clears throat> so he said, before you turn in, would you like to have, you know, somebody type it? I said, yeah, sure, right. You know, I want to be able to read it. And uh, he said, well, there's a girl on the program who does my typing. Let's give it to her. She'll do it. And, you know, you pay her the money. I said, super. You know, I'd like to have somebody in the program get the dough. So I dropped it off this girl's house. I knew. Left it. Three days later, she called me. She said, I've just finished typing this for you. And she said, you know, it's really not bad. I really like it. She said, did Jim tell you what I do for a living or where I work? And I said, no, he didn't. I have no idea what you do where you work. She said, oh, well, I work at Universal Studios. I'm a secretary to the associate producer on Ironsides. <laughs> I couldn't have worked this one out on a bet, man. <laughs> if I had brought all of the massy brain power of the last 46 years of my life to bear, I couldn't have worked this one out. <laughs> she took it in, gave it to him, he read it, and he liked it, and I took it in and they bought it. That was 14 years ago. I've been writing ever since. Today I'm a supervising producer at a major studio. They love me. They think I'm really smart, which is funny. I'm in control. I love that control. <laughs> <laughs> Now I don't have to put it in my personal life. i got all these other mothers, right? <laughs> Fix that, go here, do this. No, you can't, he can't. You know, it's a trip. I have to go in and be an adult. Oh, my God. <laughs> that was hard because, you know, the kid don't want to go in the morning. I don't want to go, man. It's more than I can handle. Alcoholics are easily overwhelmed. You know. <clears throat> That's part of the nature of our disease, I've been told by experts, is the fact that we are extremely easily overwhelmed. I mean, w getting up can be more than I am willing to deal with for the day, you know. <clears throat> Screw going anywhere, that's not even an issue, you know. <laughs> I have had to simplify my life into showing up in little bitty steps, and I swear to God, it works. It works. I get up and I show up in the bathroom and shave. That's it. Don't talk to me about what I got to do later. I don't even want to know about that, but I can shave. And then I will show up in the shower and shower. I will show up in front of the closet and God's help, I'll get dressed. <clears throat> I will show up in the garage, get in the vehicle and aim it in the general direction of where I have to go. That's the best I can do some days because I'm so easily overwhelmed. But as I get a better opinion of myself, I am less easily overwhelmed. Most mornings I get up now, and those of you who've known me for a long time will really find this hard to believe. I am quiet, I am at peace, and I'm delighted to be going where I'm going. I have no problem. I enjoy shaving, I enjoy showering, I enjoy getting in my car, and I love going to the studio. It's a world of magic. I am very happy to be there now. I also am coming to accept the fact that I am a very good writer. And that must be why they pay me all the goddamn money they pay me to do what I do, you see. 
And it's like, <clears throat> I believe everything is good out there. Things are really okay. But I believe that with a broken back. All right? And it's kind of like, part of it is just coming to know that you are worthwhile. And that God be sure. I mean, look at the maneuvering and the manipulating to get me where I am. Look at the things that transpired in my life. I didn't do any of this. God did it. I didn't know that Jim wrote. You know? I didn't know that the girl that I gave the thing to worked for the goddamn studio on the show that I was writing the story for. I didn't know that I could write. I can't spell. Writing seems to be a rather awesome thing to take on, you know. So, <clears throat> Only if you're a technical writer. <laughs> Other than that, it's okay. It's like, I see my goals in life. It's like I was telling a couple of friends today, you know, I now can see the light at the end of the tunnel and I know it's not a train. <laughs> I was talking to my therapist Thursday before I left to come here and I said, we've been through a lot in the last two years. And I said, and I feel really terrific, and I'm not bullshitting myself for a minute. I've got a long yet to do, a long ways yet to go. But I now believe that it is limitless what I can have, absolutely limitless. And the interesting thing about that is, I am you and you are me, man. You can't sit there and tell me that somehow I'm different than you. I mean... You know, unless you, you know, what are you going to say? I mean, you, I mean, you got worse education than mine, or you did worse in English than I did, or, you know, what the hell are you going to tell me? What are you going to say to me? I mean, there's, you can't say it. You can't say it. And I can't believe that God's going to do it for me and not do it for somebody else, you know? And I watch people today in the program. There's a gang of, 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 of younger people, new people in L.A., and they're listening, right? And they're listening to everything that all of us poor bastards that have suffered all this shit have gone through, and they, they're wonderful. So I don't think I want to go through that. You know? I think I'd, I think I'd like to let go today. You know what I mean? <clears throat> we really appreciate you doing that, but you don't mind if we don't follow the same path. And God bless you, man, because I don't mind a bit. No, don't follow the same path. I hope you can get to where I got to and you can do it in three years or four years, you know? And don't be afraid of outside help if you need it. And I'm not saying you got to go get it. It's just that after 17 years of working the program, I've gone as far as I could go with the tools that were available to me, and I had to get more help. That was only for me. It was necessary for me because I couldn't make any area of my life work. If I had another hour, I'd go into relationships. I don't, but you'll learn enough about those at the dance anyway, so <laughs> it's not important. <laughs> I want to say thank you to... Uh, the committee for asking me, but I want to say particularly thank you to you people in Seattle. The only reason I'm here, I missed about five conventions last year for a number of reasons, but the only reason I'm here is I have ever, never come to Seattle, to this area, without always taking something home with me. I mean, this to me is, is a very special area, and a lot of very special people are here, and uh, and it just knocks me out, because I can't tell you how much you mean to me. See, I never come here that I don't go away from this place a better person, which says a lot for for you and for your program and for your energy and your enthusiasm. And I love the thing about belonging. You know, I get on a plane and come to Seattle. Why? Because I really feel like I belong. I mean, I live thousands of miles away, but it's okay. See, I belong here. So, you know, I don't know if I've given anybody anything or, or if I can make you feel a little bit better about yourself or if I can let you know, man, you are the most important goddamn person in the world. You are. And don't sell yourself out for anybody. Or for anything. And don't do it to sell yourself out for loneliness. You're really important. But i got to say to you, you are so special to me. I am just privileged to, 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 to come be part of all this. And let's have a great dance. And God bless all of you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.